uh, and I, and I will now uh, share the screen. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, one of the featured sessions at the 14th Biennale Conference of the Asian Association of Social Psychology. My name is Igor Crossman, and I am here today to introduce you to the science of wisdom in the face of world social challenges. As you can imagine, uh, the world we live in today, and I probably don't have to explain it uh, to any uh, individual who is in attendance here, is at the crossroads. We have massive floods, uh, we have uh, fires, geopolitical tensions, uh, refugee crisis, uh, climate crisis, and of course the pandemic uh, that has been uh, really revamping everything that we know and consider normal. One of the things during the pandemic that many of us were thinking a lot about is, well, how do you navigate different dilemmas such as freedom and family security versus protection of most vulnerable? How to navigate such challenges? What kind of moral principles can you apply? And in philosophy, in moral philosophy in particular, the question about navigating uncertainty and moral dilemmas typically invokes the idea of wisdom, a concept that until recently has not been really in the focus of psychological research. And we want to change that. Uh, we want to focus on the psychology of wisdom. And uh, recently uh, there was um, uh, an attempt to uh, get a common position among the psychological scientists, which underscores a set of psychological processes, including um, management of uncertainty. Some of you have just been to the talk by Professor Hogg, who talked about the detriment detrimental uh, side of uncertainty. What about the ways to manage such uncertainty in a way that can promote uh, uh, wisdom? As well as, um, in addition to this metacognitive features that help to manage uncertainty, moral aspirations. And so in the four talks that you will see today, uh, we will uh, talk about the most cutting edge research on this topic. We will proceed in the order in which uh, they are presented in the uh, program. And we will have about 12 minutes, uh, 13 minutes for each talk, uh, followed by a, a few clarification questions. You can also put your questions in the chat in case you're uncomfortable uh, you know, speaking up. And uh, we will reserve a larger discussion for the end of this session. So without any further ado, I will uh, present to you the first talk and I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, yeah, please go ahead. So, okay. So, we can start sharing. So, um, can you all share, uh, see my screen? Okay. Yes. So, um, so thanks, Igor, for organizing this symposium. And um, it's great honor to be here to share this um, research with all of you here. And um, so in this study, we look at, so I think Igor already kind of set up the background of the um, research that we are working on. So basically, you know, we probably don't need any you know, information to know more about how you know, the world has been changing. And we see quite a lot of um, you know, polarized um, conflicts in different parts of the world. So. As part of this study, what we're trying to look at is what role does wisdom play in terms of uh, potentially reducing polarized societal conflicts. And of course, with this topic in mind, part of the reasoning behind it is that uh, in order to reconciliate, in order to resolve conflict, an important aspect of um, is being able to resolve conflict and you know, promote um, interpersonal or social harmony is to, you know, first of all, you know, people would be able to listen to each other. You know, people, regardless of what end they're at, um, it's important for them to just you know, be able to listen to the others. But what usually happens is that when people feel you know, very strongly, negatively about you know, the perceived outgroup, they tend to you know, maybe even not even bother about listening to the other part. So not to talk about re potentially um, reconciling a conflict. So with this in mind, in our study, we try to look at kind of like the first step, initial step towards promoting 
um, conflict reconciliation. And uh, so we look at how wisdom play a role in reducing um, attitude polarization. So in our study, we look at specifically about how wise reasoning can help to play a role in promoting more positive intergroup relations. And we conceptualize wise reasoning as a cognitive integrative reasoning process that incorporate four different aspects, um, which I think some of you might already be familiar with. So it's based on Igor and um, Rianza's work on um, wisdom. And so basically for wise reasoning, it consists of epistemic humility, being able to recognize the uncertainty and being able to take a look at the bigger picture and also try to understand the perspective and situations from different angles. And also being able to integrate divergent, you know, potentially perceived divergent interests of different parties. So this is all a component that are very important in resolving conflicts. And so a lot of the existing study have shown that wise reasoning can increase pro-social behavior. It can also lead people to hold more balanced attitude towards other when they have interpersonal, the personal conflict with other person. So with this in mind, in this line of research, what we are trying to look at is whether wise reasoning can help to promote a more balanced attitude when there is higher social intergroup conflict and potentially leading to less intergroup polarization and also um, promote more intergroup um, positive outcome. And this set of study that we have conducted, um, all the study were conducted during you know, heightened societal conflicts. They're conducted across different contexts. And so um, given the time that, that we have, um, we only have 30 minutes, so I won't be able to go into the specific context for each study. But just to give you a more general overview of that, because our first study actually started in 2014. So if we were to talk about each of the study and context in that, probably it would take you know, years to really go into each of them. So we talk about, you know, provide you with an overview very briefly. Um, I'll be quick um, and brief, for the, especially for the first um, five correlational studies so that we'll save you know, more time or sufficient time for the later studies. And so for study one to five, they are all correlational study. And generally across all the various conflict contexts, what we do is that um, we would provide news clipping or image about an ongoing conflict. And the conflict context can range from potentially ideological conflicts um, in, um, in the context of you know, having protests where uh, there are people who are in support of protesters and there are people who are also more in support of law enforcement. So that could be ideological divide. And so the first two study um, was conducted in Hong Kong and also in the second study is conducted under the context of the Baltimore protest from 2015. And then in the third study, we look into, you know, in addition to ideological conflict, you know, what role my wise reasoning play in terms of promoting more positive intergroup dynamics. And so the third study, we look into more resource-based um, real realistic conflicts and to see whether wise reasoning would also be applicable to um, you know, resource conflict beyond just you know, ideological differences. In study four and five, uh, we would look at how wise reasoning might affect um, people's attitude towards their outgroup in terms of um, ideological conflict um, on the issues of same sex marriage. And so, across all the study, what are common across them is that we present people with the images about the ongoing conflict, and then we assess people's feeling towards the in group and or towards the outgroup. And each of the study vary in terms of the design, in terms of whether it's like between subjects or between subjects, and also in terms of people's you know, in-group, out-group membership. And, and we also assess people's wise reasoning, so it's correlational, and we assess how um, people actually engage, what kind of reasoning process do people engage in while they are thinking about the particular conflict that they, they were presented in front of them. And so um, for the first study, you know, we skip very quickly to the results. So for, for the first two studies, what we found in general is that um, with higher wise reasoning, it tends to um, result in more positive attitude towards the outgroup. And, um, and uh, it's very depending on um, the group membership. So when people uh, who engage in higher wise reasoning, they tend to show more positive attitude towards outgroup. Um, but then also at the same time, it wasn't like they you know, really you know, 
kind of flip over and lost the over, over the inward, but it's more like they reduce the attitude polarization so that it's not necessarily that they reverse it and they you know, love the outgroup but not inward, but it's more like they reduce the magnitude of attitude polarization where they were less likely to dislike the outgroup. You know, at least it build a basis for potential conversation if we think of it in terms of for people to potentially try to resolve differences in conflict. And so this is what we found in the first two study where wise reasoning generally reduces people's attitude polarization by promoting more positive attitude towards outgroup. Um, but usually it doesn't show um, a negative impact on in-group. Usually it doesn't affect people's attitude towards um, the in-group. And, and then in study three, um, the study on realistic conflict, we also found very similar pattern that uh, when people engage in wise reasoning, they tend to, um, you know, as you can see, they uh, behind the wise reasoning is not that they change their attitude towards the in-group. So the attitude towards in-group is pretty stable, but what makes a difference is that for people who are um, having higher um, wise reasoning, they tend to show a, a, a positivity towards um, our group. And what you see is also that for people who are higher on wise reasoning, they were less likely to have attitude polarization compared with people who were lower on wise reasoning. So that's what we found in our third study and um, in the context of realistic conflict. And in our fourth and our fifth study, we look into this in the context of same-sex marriage. And study four and five differ from the previous study is that because in the previous study, we usually just look at it either um, um, mainly from the perspective of the majority group and look at how they would, you know, how wise reasoning would affect the um, attitude towards the out group. Um, so what happened in study four and five is that we actually kind of want to look at the process of whether wise reasoning have like kind of like a mirror image effect for both majority group and minority group. Because if we again think about that in terms of the context of conflict management, just by having one side to try to reconcile it, it doesn't work. It need people on both ends to really you know, at least you know, reduce the, the negative attitude towards the other group and at least try to be able to listen to the other side. So what we see here is that um, in this study on the issue of same-sex marriage, we recruited Christian conservative participants and also um, participants more on the liberal end um, or from the LGBT community. And what we found is that across both study four and five, we found that um, there is um, an effect where the group membership in fact um, interact with the target group evaluation and is moderated by wise reasoning. And if you look at the figure, um, so basically study four and five show very similar pattern of results. And what you see here is that for the um, graph on the top is um, the responses of non Christian heterosexual participants from study five. And what you see again is that wise reasoning tend to reduce attitude polarization. Um, they reduce the attitude polarization towards in group versus out group. And it is done through seeing more positivity. Um, towards the, um, the outcome. And um, in figure B is the responses from the um, uh, lesbian, gay, or bisexual participants. And what you see is also a very similar pattern where um, the higher people engage in wise reasoning, the less attitude polarization they experience when they're looking, evaluating the in-group versus out-group. And um, the lower the wise reasoning, the more attitude polarization. So from across all these studies, what we see is that wise reasoning, regardless of your group membership, regardless of your um, group membership status, um, majority group or minority group, and what it seems to be working at work is that wise reasoning tends to reduce multitude polarization between our group and in group. You are less likely to feel you know, very strongly negatively towards your own group. Uh, and so this is what we see across the five correlational study across different kind of conflict from ideological conflict to realistic conflict. And so we have done the meta-analysis across all the five studies, and we found that generally wise reasoning tend to promote positive attitude towards our group because what we need to decide. And for attitude polarization, what we found is that for wise reasoning, um, usually is people who have lower wise reasoning that tend to show more attitude polarization. But for people who engage in higher wise reasoning, um, again, it's not like we flip over and change people's and make them, and then people become more positive towards the outgroup. 
But what you see is that they reduce their negative feeling towards the outgroup. So they're showing less negative polarization. So that's what we found in our first five study. And then in our study six and seven, that's the experimental studies. And what we did is that we did a very brief online wise reasoning intervention for exercise to try to promote people to engage in wise reasoning. And at the same time, we also, um, like in the previous study, we showed them news clipping about some ongoing conflict. And then we assessed the feeling towards the different group. In this two study, study six, we conducted um, in the US and in the UK. It was at a time when there were quite a lot of debate about immigration issues. And our participants in this study were white American or British, um, white British. Um, and we look at their attitude towards the perceived in-group and out-group, which is um, in that context would be British citizen um, versus immigrants. And we looked at how by engaging them in a wise reason exercise, whether it would affect their attitude towards the in-group and out-group. And in study seven, the context was conducted in, um, you know, in the context of COVID. About, you know, probably we all um, aware are aware of that in the news that there were very strong anti-Asian sentiments during the time of COVID, um, in the, especially in the U.S. And so we also conducted this study in the U.S. Um, among white Americans. And what we want to look at is that whether by engaging people in wise reason, it might help to reduce polarization, and also whether it might promote more. Um, positivity towards the outgroup. And in addition to that, um, in study seven, we also have an active control condition um, just to rule out the fact that because in the usual wise reasoning, we get up in a control condition where they didn't really engage in any kind of reasoning. So in study seven, we have an active control condition where we ask people to also done a similar task that involves writing and thinking about things. But then the only thing is that we didn't engage them in specifically doing a price reasoning process. And so this is what we did in the two experiments. And in study six, what we found is that um, for people who were asked to engage in this reasoning exercise, they, as expected, they show less attitude polarization. And such reduction in attitude polarization is actually beneficial in terms of it um, increased motivation for intergroup contact, and they were less likely to endorse um, a hostile immigration policy for people who engage in wise reasoning. And also they were more likely in terms of behavioral outcome, they were more likely to donate to um, immigrant charity and also um, the donation amount tend to also be higher. And so what we see in study six is that in the context of the debate about immigration, uh, what we see is wise reasoning by engaging people in this thinking process, it can reduce the attitude polarization and also increase the likelihood that they would um, be more likely to continue in supporting um, um, immigrants um, a policy that were you know, more um, friendly to immigrants. And so that's study six. And so in study seven, what we did was that um, we also um, tried to look into um, that in the context of COVID. And so Igor sent me a message that we need to wrap up. So I'll finish it very quickly. So in study seven, uh, what we see is that in the context of COVID, um, for the um, white American participants, when they are engaging in the wise reasoning process, we also observe less attitude polarization. So they were less likely to show a negative attitude towards outgroup, or radically, um, or in other words, more positive attitude towards the outgroup, and less attitude polarization. And um, so that's a trend in that. Um, and also what we look into is whether political orientation moderated in fact, because um, political orientation um, in our power study is shown to actually a uh, key factor that are driving attitude polarization. So we look into political orientation as a moderating factor. And so we found that um, in fact, wise reasoning exercise by engaging in it, it helped to reduce attitude polarization, even among people who seem to be you know, the least likely um, to be um, do less polarized. And in our exploratory analysis, we actually found that by engaging people in wise reasoning, it's more likely to um, lead them to reduce the use of the day of the third person plural. So we know that from intergroup literature, there is you know, a we and they differentiation, in-group, out-group differentiation. And we found that the wise reasoning exercise actually lead people to reduce the use of this third person plural. And so overall, 
Uh, Moist reasoning is related to less attitude polarization through more positive attitude towards the outgroup. group. And the effect is quite reliable across different groups into different contexts and also different culture. And so this work um, is um, um, just published in um, Nature Communications. So if you would like to get more details, um, feel free to get there um, to this article. It's open access. And so thank you very much for being in this um, symposium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melody. And uh, now we are transitioning. <clears throat> we'll probably reserve uh, your questions for them, but also please put them in the chat uh, and we can collect them. Um, and uh, in the meantime, we will uh, pass the torch, uh, I believe, to Patricia. Uh, and uh, Patricia, are you ready? Excellent. Okay, are you able to see my, my slide? Yes, again. Right? Perfect, thank you. Um, hi, for those of you who don't know me, I am Patricia Chen, an assistant professor at the National University of Singapore. Uh, delighted to be here to share our work on a strategic mindset. As we heard from Ego and Melody, our changing and increasingly uncertain world calls for more wisdom. A central aspect of such wisdom is metacognition which non-exhaustively includes qualities like the propensity for forethought and openness to alternatives, self-awareness and monitoring, reflection, and the flexibility to self-correct and adapt, for example. Now, why are some people metacognitively wiser than others? And how can we make people metacognitively wiser to empower them to pursue important goals in life effectively? One perspective, a rather dominant one, has been that some people are equipped with more metacognitive skills. They've been taught or they've learned how to make plans, self-monitor or self-reflect, for example. And because of this dominant perspective, psychologists, especially social psychologists, have generally conceptualized, measured and intervened upon metacognitive strategies as a set of separate but interrelated skills. Indeed, using such skills predicts greater goal progress and achievement across important domains of life, as we know from decades of research. Some examples of such metacognitive interventions include interventions that teach students how to plan and organize their study time, those that teach people how to make if-then implementation intentions, and those that encourage people to track how much progress they're making towards their goals. But this skills-based explanation alone doesn't quite seem sufficient to explain why some people naturally and spontaneously use more metacognitive strategies than others, especially when faced with challenges. So just knowing or having these strategies in one's repertoire is no guarantee that one will use them when they're actually needed. For example, Many students may already know how to use a calendar to schedule their study time, make mind maps, or test themselves. Yet when they study, many students often lack the thoughtfulness about how they should use these strategies to learn more effectively. When people get stuck or encounter failure, many fall into helpless responses rather than think about what they might do differently. We offer a different complementary perspective to the skills focused angle. Beyond simply possessing knowledge of skills, we introduce the idea of a general orientation or mindset towards being metacognitive. We call this a strategic mindset, a general tendency towards self priming strategy use. In moments of challenge, unproductivity, or novel situations, a strategic mindset involves frequently and spontaneously asking oneself strategy eliciting questions, such as, what can I do to help myself? How else can I do this? Is there a way to do this even better? Asking these questions can serve as a self-prime that prompts people to generate and use strategies appropriate to a task. A strategic mindset, therefore, is not simply having 
more knowledge of more strategies or using one particular strategy to a great degree. Instead, it's a general tendency towards self-priming strategy use more broadly. Our research has found that this strategic mindset predicts and causally changes people's metacognition across a variety of important life domains, cultures, and age groups. In the interest of time, I will just focus on three main studies from this ongoing research program. To summarize, the hypothesis that we set out to test states that a strategic mindset predicts and causally increases the use of metacognitive strategies. And in turn, using more metacognitive strategies predicts greater goal progress and achievement. We expected an indirect effect of a strategic mindset on goal achievement because simply asking oneself strategic mindset questions may not in itself make people higher performers. Rather, these self primes need to be translated into effective strategies to make people more likely to achieve their goals. In one study, we looked at how effectively students learned and performed. We surveyed 365 college students during the fall term about their strategic mindset. We used a six item strategic mindset scale across our studies with questions such as, when you are struggling with something, how often do you ask yourself, what can I do to help myself? Whenever you feel like you're not making progress, how often do you ask yourself, is there a better way of doing this? Scale reliability was high across our studies. Later in the survey, we also asked students to report how frequently they used metacognitive strategies for learning across their classes, such as planning, self-monitoring, and changing study methods when they're unproductive. For example, when studying for a class, I tend to keep track of how effective my learning approach is. In every class I take, I think about the specific steps I have to take to achieve the grades I want. These items were adapted to be class general from the well-known MSLQ. With students' consent, we obtained their fall term GPA for that same term and also their GPA for the subsequent winter term in which they took a different set of classes other than the ones they reported their strategic mindset and metacognitive strategies in. The results were the same for both outcome measures. So I'll just focus on the results for the more interesting outcome, the later. <laughs> in line with our hypothesis, the higher students scored on a strategic mindset, the more they reported using metacognitive strategies in their classes during the fall. And the more they use these metacognitive strategies, the better they did, not just in the fall term, but also in the subsequent winter term in new and different classes as shown here. There was no direct or total effect of a strategic mindset on GPA, but as expected, a significant indirect effect through metacognitive strategy use. Another study further investigated whether this strategic mindset is indeed a domain general tendency that has implications for effective goal pursuit more broadly. Here, we tested the implications it might have for adults' professional or educational and health or fitness goals. Another purpose of this study was to test whether this strategic mindset has explanatory power above and beyond other self-regulatory and mindset constructs related to goal progress, which I'll describe later. Participants completed our strategic mindset scale as in study one, and they were asked to list a current professional or educational goal of theirs, such as learning programming in Python or finishing their two-year degree in college. And also a current health or fitness goal of theirs that they were pursuing that's important, such as I want to lose 10 pounds or I want to be able to run six miles a day. As our primary outcome measure of goal progress, they reported how much progress they had made towards each of their goals on a seven point scale. Using a similar, but a domain general version of the metacognitive strategy scale, participants then rated their metacognition as they pursued their professional or educational goals, 
and also their health or fitness goals listed. We found support for our theorized model across these various domains, including their professional or educational goals and their health or fitness goals. Indirect effects were again significant in both models, replicating our earlier studies result. These findings indicated that a strategic mindset can indeed generalize to important goals across a variety of domains. Furthermore, this strategic mindset had unique predictive value, even when we controlled for students' general self-efficacy, self-control, grit, and growth mindsets. Next, we built upon these correlational field studies to test whether there was a causal relationship between a strategic mindset and metacognitive strategies. We conducted a randomized controlled experiment in the lab to control for the possibility that people who score higher on a strategic mindset may simply have a wider repertoire of strategies to begin with, greater prior success, or other baseline differences that might be associated with greater use of these metacognitive strategies. We designed a two-part experiment. In part one, participants were randomly assigned to read either an article that induced a strategic mindset or an irrelevant control article of the same length and format. They then summarized the article to share it with others to encourage them to endorse and internalize the message as is typical of saying is believing exercises. Now in the next part of the study labeled a new and different study, participants were given an unfamiliar and challenging task by a different experimenter. In two minutes, they had to crack eggs and separate the egg whites from the yolks as quickly as possible. The person in this study who collected the most egg white in two minutes would win $100. This task was carefully designed and pre-tested to meet three criteria. It was relatively unfamiliar and challenging to most participants. It could be accomplished with many different methods, some of which were more efficient than others and there were clear performance metrics. We measured participants' reported use of metacognitive strategies as they went about the task. Our main outcome measure was their actual performance speed on the task. And in addition, we also videotaped and coded how much they voluntarily practiced the task on their own before they had to perform. Because practice is a behavioral indication of forethought and preparation key aspects of metacognition. Again, we found support for our theorized model. Those in the strategic mindset condition reported using more metacognitive strategies during the task, which in turn related to higher performance speed. Our analysis also controlled for participants' prior experience with this task which was significantly correlated with every dependent variable. We corroborated our self-reported metacognitive strategies measure with two other measures. Participants' concrete descriptions of every technique they had used and independent observers' coding of their technique use. Hence, this experiment provided validation of our metacognitive strategy use self-report measure, but also causal evidence that instilling a strategic mindset can increase people's reported and observed use of metacognitive strategies. In addition, instilling a strategic mindset also increased practice. Those in the strategic mindset condition had 2.4 times higher odds of practicing compared to the controls. And they also practiced on more eggs on average. Across our studies, a strategic mindset predicted people's spontaneous and frequent use of metacognitive strategies as people pursued high college GPAs, important professional educational health and fitness goals, and even faster performance on an unfamiliar, challenging task. Our findings invite psychologists to reconsider what metacognitive wisdom entails. Metacognition it's not simply having a larger set of skills, 
but importantly, a strategic orientation above and beyond possessing individual skills matters. This is a mindset that one can inculcate, a simple habit that one can learn to become wiser and more successful in life. My ongoing studies are further investigating this exciting line of strategic mindset research, replicating these results in Singapore, and showing that this strategic mindset can also promote cognitive flexibility and well being. In closing, I'd like to thank my main collaborators who have made this journey nothing short of strategic and exciting. And thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Patricia. This was a terrific presentation right on time. We have a number of people who are clapping right now. You may not hear them, but they are there. And um, we probably have maybe uh, a few, one or two minutes for any direct clarification questions. Uh, if you have any, please raise your hand. Um, otherwise, uh, we will transition in the meantime to Jonah. Uh, who uh, can uh, start setting up his slides for his presentation. So are there any clarification questions in the meantime? People are a little bit shy. It's okay. doesn't seem to be the case right now, please put your questions in the chat if you want or save them for more substantive questions for the discussion at the end. Um, thank you again, Patricia. And we'll be moving on to Jonah now, who will tell us a little bit about uh, intellectual humility and misinformation. Jonah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Igor. Can everyone see and hear me correctly? Great, okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am uh, Jonah Kecky, a, a graduate student at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and today I will be discussing a series of studies examining um, how intellectual humility may be related to scrutiny of misinformation, in particular related to COVID-19. Um, and I should note that this work is being done in collaboration with my research advisor, Karina Schumann, also at the University of Pittsburgh, as well as with our other collaborator, Tanil Porter at the University of Pennsylvania. Hmm, why isn't it moving forward there? Oh, there we go. Okay, uh, we started this line of work uh, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. As the virus spread across the globe at rapid speeds, so also did misinformation about the virus. According to polls done during this time, many people were turning to social media for information. Unfortunately, this also led to massive amounts of misinformation, including claims of magical cures or attempts to downplay the severity of the virus. This is concerning as according to research on super spreading events, even a small number of people not following the guidance of health professionals can lead to large spikes in infections. It is for these reasons that the WHO referred to the spread of misinformation about the virus as an infodemic to go along with the current pandemic. So what can protect people from falling for misinformation online? According to previous work, analytic thinking as measured by the cognitive reflection test, acts as a consistent predictor of resisting misinformation and perceiving that misinformation to be inaccurate. However, to our knowledge, there's little work assessing predictors of what tangible actions people can take in order to protect themselves from misinformation. So this is the question that we're asking in this work is what can people actually do to protect themselves from misinformation and what predicts this? We theorize that people can engage in what we are calling investigative behaviors, or behaviors aimed at investigating the veracity of misinformation that one may encounter. These are things like searching for the source of an article that uh, you come across or reading the full article that the headline came from and others. We further theorize that intellectual humility may act as a significant predictor of these kinds of behaviors. Intellectual humility, or IH, uh, it is has many different conceptual definitions, but it's most often recognized as uh, being able to recognize the fallibility in one's own knowledge, to be able to know when you are wrong or that you may be wrong. It has been found to predict greater willingness to learn new information and seek out information counter to one's current views. 
Those hired in intellectual humility are motivated to seek out information to ensure that the information they do have is based on solid evidence. Therefore, the hypothesis for this line of work is that those hired in intellectual humility will show a greater desire to engage in investigative behaviors when encountering misinformation in the context of COVID-19. Our first study to test this hypothesis was pre-registered and run on March 31st of 2020. At this time, there were about 5,000 COVID-19 deaths in the United States where the study was run. This study was run through Prolific Academic, an online recruitment site, and our final collected sample was 182 participants, all from the United States. Participants first completed the General Intellectual Humility Scale by Leary and colleagues. It is a highly validated scale that includes six items, such as I accept that my beliefs and attitudes may be wrong. Um, and this was found to be internally consistent in our study as well. Participants also completed a number of other potential covariates, such as political orientation, level of education, and the cognitive reflection test, again, a measure of analytic thinking. Next, participants viewed four news headlines in a randomized order. Two of these headlines were fact-checked to be false by Snopes.com, a popular fact-checking website, and two were fact to be true by the same website. So the one on the left is an example of one of the misinformation articles uh, saying that one year ago, scientists warned of this coronavirus outbreak and said it could kill 65 million people. And the one on the right is a, a factually correct article that was also reported by uh, news websites such as the New York Times, which is that Italy confirmed almost 200 deaths in 24 hours. And so these were both very relevant at the time of launching this study. Participants were then asked about their willingness to engage in a number of different investigative behaviors after each of these articles. They were asked whether they would like to fact check this article, whether they would like to learn more about the source of it, whether they would like to read the full article, and whether they'd be willing to seek alternative views on the topic expressed in the headline. These are the sorts of behaviors recommended by news literacy organizations, as well as major news outlets such as the New York Times. These were averaged together across real and fake articles and found to be internally consistent for both. Study one found that there was a significant association between intellectual humility and investigative behaviors for the misinformation articles with a correlation of 0.24. Further, this was not diminished when controlling for uh, relevant covariates, such as the cognitive reflection test, education, political orientation, and others, implying that there is, uh, IH acts as a unique predictor of these kinds of behaviors. Finally, the association was only found for misinformation articles, interestingly, with the real article's correlation being non-significant of 0.04. So these initial results give some credence to our hypothesis. However, it also left open a number of questions. In study two, we plan to replicate the findings from study one while also changing the context, uh, spe focused specifically on social distancing behaviors. At the time this study was run, social distancing was considered a somewhat controversial practice in the United States, with anti-social distancing protests popping up around the country. Therefore, study two was pre-registered and run on April 14th of 2020. At this time, there are approximately 30,000 COVID deaths in the United States. Again, this was run through Prolific Academic, an online recruitment site. And our final sample for study two was 473 participants, again, all from the United States. Given the partisan divide about social distancing at the time of launching this study, we wanted to include roughly equal numbers of liberal and conservative participants to ensure that the effect was present for both. Therefore, using built-in pre-screening, our final sample was roughly even in terms of liberals and conservatives. As in study one, the participants first completed the general intellectual humility scale by Leary and colleagues, along with a number of potential covariates. Given the null findings for real articles in study one, we decided to focus specifically on the misinformation articles in study two. Therefore, out of a pool of two potential articles, participants saw one misinformation article, uh, and both of these were focused on social distancing. So participants were randomly assigned to see one of two misinformation articles about social distancing. We included uh, two options to ensure that the effect was uh, not based on a specific headline or um, sort of line of reasoning about social distancing. So the one on the left is using an economic argument saying that social distancing is, uh, need, is bad for the economy. And on the right, it's more of an efficacy argument saying that it just doesn't work according to doctors. And we found no difference between these headlines on investigative behaviors. And there was no interaction with intellectual humility based on which headline they got. 
Participants then completed the same investigative behavior scale as in study one, again, found to be internally consistent. The results from study two showed that it replicated the effects of study one with intellectual humility, predicting investigative behaviors with a correlation of 0.27. Further, when controlling for all of the uh, covariates, including things such as political orientation, concern about COVID-19, education level, and the CRT, uh, this remains significant. Study two replicated the effects of study one in this new context. However, so far we had only tested intentions to engage in these kinds of behaviors and not actual behaviors. So this will be the focus of study three. The goal of study three was to again, replicate this finding, but now using a behavioral measure of investigative behaviors. Further, we wanted to update the context, this time focusing on mask wearing, which was again, controversial in the United States at the time of launching the study. Study three was pre-registered and launched on August 10th in 2020. At this time, there are approximately 160,000 United States COVID deaths. The final sample for this study was 177 participants. And again, we screened to include roughly equal numbers of liberals and conservatives. Participants first saw this, first completed the same Leary and colleagues general intellectual humility scale. They then, like in study two, viewed one of two misinformation articles, except this time they were both focused on mask wearing. So the articles were both chosen to be false by Snopes.com. Again, no moderation effects by article condition, but you can see on the left, um, this uh, one is all about how mask wearing can be dangerous according to the US Occupational Safety and Health Administration. On the right, it's about a supposed uh, exemption card that the US Department of Justice was passing around. Again, both found to be false by uh, objective fact checkers. For investigative behaviors, we asked participants, you know, have the option to open a new tab and search the internet to learn more about this article. Would you like to take this opportunity with a binary yes, no answer option? If participants indicated that they would like to take this opportunity, then they were instructed to open a new tab and report back on any URLs that they visited, search terms that they used, etc. Those who said yes but failed to answer these follow-up questions in a substantial way were removed from the analyses. If participants indicated that they would not like to engage in these behaviors, then they were asked a number of pre-registered filler questions, such as how does this article make you feel? For the analysis, we coded investigative behaviors as zero being chose not to engage, one being chose to engage, and then we ran a number of binary logistic regressions. And again, as in previous studies, intellectual humility predicted significantly greater likelihood of engaging in these kinds of behaviors with an odds ratio of 1.58. And then like in previous studies, this remains significant when controlling for a number of covariates such as interest in the article, political orientation, and education. In this way, we replicated the effect of studies one and two, now using an actual behavioral measure of our dependent variable. So across these three studies, intellectual humility predicted scrutiny of COVID-19 misinformation. To our knowledge, it's the first research that focuses on motivational factors related to how people interact with, dig with digital misinformation. I should note that in study one, we did find that intellectual humility only predicts these behaviors when the articles were in fact misinformation. This implies that there is some effective circumstance and future research should focus on in what situations uh, and what kinds of articles intellectual humility best predicts these sorts of behaviors. Finally, given how critical it is to reduce reliance on misinformation in this important time, future work should also focus on interventions to improve intellectual humility and also teach the use of investigative behaviors when encountering this sort of misinformation. There were a number of limitations for these studies, but the primary one was that these were so far all correlational in nature, measuring as opposed to manipulating intellectual humility. We did not manipulate intellectual humility as there was relatively limited research on the manipulation of intellectual humility in the short term. However, future research should attempt to use these newer manipulations and use a fully experimental design. Second, we did not specifically assess the utility of investigative behaviors. So does engaging these behaviors actually lead to better accuracy ratings? As we did not experimentally assign participants to engage in this, the current studies cannot answer this question. Though I should note that we are currently in the process of running follow-up studies to test this assumption more directly. With that, I'd just like to say thank you uh, for any questions or comments that I don't get to here. Please uh, feel free to email me. And uh, thanks again to my advisor, Karina Schumann, and our collaborator, Tanil Porter, for this, uh, their help in this line of work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jonah. Um, again, we have uh, we have hands uh, that are clapping, as you can see, and uh, we'll uh, maybe take uh, a minute or two 
uh, well, maybe a minute uh, to see if there are any additional questions uh, before we'll get uh, to the final presentation that you so beautifully set up at the end. Okay. And again, uh, to the audience, uh, we have a lot of people here in the room. In case you are shy or uh, don't want to interrupt, uh, please post your questions either uh, in here in the chat or on uh, the um, Volva platform, and we will try to address them uh, in a timely fashion. Okay. Uh, so. Um, I will now transition uh, to the uh, final uh, presentation. And uh, let me try to do a screen share. All right. I guess that's me. Let me just quickly move myself around so you, so you can see my screen a little better. Okay, so you heard already a lot about the value of various aspects of wisdom, including metacognition. At the beginning of the symposium, uh, you uh, heard about the role of certain forms of metacognitive processes. You had a few presentations about how they may help to coordinate and solve intergroup conflicts better, how they may be able to help you see through illusions and misinformation, as well as how they can motivate you to be maybe a better person. But the key question that Jonah raised here at the end was, well, wisdom is valued, but how do you develop it? Over centuries, millennia, we had different real or false prophets tell us about how to do it. There are books written about it, but what about empirical evidence about this set of matter, cognitive or other type of process? My journey to this question came through a set of uh, interesting sidesteps. At some point when I was still in graduate school, I encountered uh, this uh, idea about King Solomon, and I was pursuing the study of wisdom. And then later when I became a professor, it occurred to me that, well, King Solomon was of course this wise biblical king whom everybody came for advice. But at the same time, it is also known that he was not really good in his own life. Uh, so, you know, this may be the story about him uh, figuring out who the real mother was, but he also had uh, 500 wives, I don't know, he had probably a lot of stamina, uh, but at the same time, uh, he, they were all preaching to their own gods. Um, he liked to brag about the wealth. Uh, he didn't spend time educating his only child. And uh, anyway, so there is some kind of an inconsistency be between his personal and the general wisdom. And some of my colleagues, in particular Ursula Staudinger and others, have written about this question. Um, but how about testing it directly? Is it true that when we're dealing with other people's problems, you are, or we are more likely to be like King Solomon? Really wise when it comes to somebody else's issues? Not so wise when it comes to our own. So I tried to do some of that, uh, and I did it in the context of interpersonal relationships, and uh, the specific setup was uh, to test among the monogamous couples, uh, what would happen if your partner admits to you that she just or he just had sex with your closest friend? And imagine it happens to you, very aversive reaction. Imagine it happens uh, to a friend who comes to you and tells you, you know what? My partner just shared with me that she had sex with closest friend. What should I do? And when people, yeah. when people engaged in this type of processes, we, when we ask them about their limits of knowledge, do they recognize that they need more information? What kind of perspectives should you consider? How about uh, how many different possibilities uh, uh, to resolve the situation are there? People are much more likely to generate more alternatives, be open-minded, recognize limits of their knowledge, and be willing to 
compromise potentially when it is a friend's issue than it is when it is your own issue. Now, what is the possible reason for that? And um, my colleague Ethan Cross and I thought that it has something to do with psychological distance. When you are dealing with a friend's issue, you are approaching it from a distance. Um, when you are dealing with your own issue, you only see this other person and this other person makes you angry. And this other person makes you want to fight back and tell them every nasty thing that you have in your head about them right away, very reflexively. So this idea that distance helps, uh, it exists in various philosophical traditions, of course. Um, and the idea behind it is it allows you to take a big picture perspective. And what is also interesting is that it is um, actually an old tradition where um, if you go back to uh, the Roman um, you know, ruler, uh, Caesar, he was also often talking to himself in a third person, creating a linguistic distance. So Iliism is a form of linguistic distance uh, that can be used as sort of a metacognitive strategy to uh, potentially uh, take a bigger picture perspective on an issue. Now, is that uh, something that really helps? Well, in the lab, uh, we tested whether this type of distance can reduce Solomon's paradox. And sure enough, we found that it is the case. So if you cross that manipulation with self versus other, it's either your infidelity or it is a friend's infidelity with uh, the reflection of it in a third person, so egoism. So what would Igor do? How would Igor reflect on it versus in the first person? What would I do? How will I feel about it? Then you eliminate uh, this asymmetry between a reflection on somebody else versus reflection on the self. So this is the first principal component of this uh, various components uh, of uh, wisdom that we discussed earlier today. Okay, so that was very nice. And we replicated it, by the way, not only for infidelity, but also for trust, betrayal, and even in personal uh, life, uh, autobiographical experiences, any type of social conflict. When you talk uh, or write in the third person, it seems to be having a small increment in making you just a tiny bit wiser in a given moment. But can we use this to train people to actually be wiser over time? So if you practice this illism, does it really make you engage habitually in this type of process more frequently on a day-to-day -day basis? That's a key question. That's what all the self-help books tried to sell you on, right? But we don't know anything about it. So why don't we test this? So it's a little masochistic study. And it is masochistic because it is a two month long longitudinal pre-post design experiment. People come into the lab, people come into the lab again, but in between for a month, every single day, they keep a diary. And they either write this diary in the third person or they write this diary in the first person. They write about the most significant issue of the day. Okay, so that's what we did. And then we took a look at the reflections from people um, that they reported about the most significant out of our, like recent interpersonal issue they reflected on before or after the diary. And we coded it on intellectual humility, perspective taking, consideration of change, and integration of diverse viewpoints. And what you can see uh, right below me is that um, in comparison to the control condition of which they wrote in the first person, uh, when they wrote in the third person using the skillism practice, uh, you see a significant difference uh, in overall uh, responses. And uh, if you break it down, uh, you can see below that, well, actually it's on this side, right? Uh, that for humility, we see a dramatic change for perspectives, we see a change, and for compromise. And that's actually quite interesting and addresses one of the questions that Jonah posed at the end of his talk about how can we train humility? Well, it seems like uh, maybe engaging in this type of uh, third person uh, reflective exercises for a month may help. Good luck with that. Uh, now, um, that's not the only thing that we did. At the end of the diary, we asked people to consider a set of six common positive and negative interpersonal scenarios with a the person they are close. And imagine what would happen if 
uh, how would you feel if this scenario occurs? And a month later, we asked people, did this really happen? And for many of the events, uh, it did happen. Like, you know, you had a celebration with a friend, a good dinner, a good conversation, or you were upset about something at the, with, a, with a close family member. And uh, then how did you actually feel? So we can compare how they expected to feel versus how did they actually feel? And uh, what we found there is that people who were in a third, who engaged in iliasm, they had a greater alignment uh, of their forecasted emotions and experienced emotions towards the close other, uh, specifically for negative emotions, um, whereas in the first person that alignment was not there. And part of the reason for that was, uh, as you can see, that like those who changed in uh, their wise reasoning over time, they were more likely to see, uh, to, uh, to show the alignment between the experienced and uh, actually occurred a ground truth, so to say, emotions uh, towards close others. Now, is this a reliable phenomenon? A reviewer decided uh, to ask us this question, how could they dare? So we had to go uh, again into the field and replicate the study in another longitudinal experiment. This time it was just a one week long experiment. We also included no instruction control condition. Uh, the modality is a bit different. So you see quite a bit of change overall. The reflective writing does help in general. Uh, but what you can also see is that the change is substantially larger in the third person training condition than in the other two conditions, so, uh, replicating uh, the conceptually the pattern that we found before. Yeah. So there is some preliminary evidence. It's very small. It's really baby steps suggesting that an Ilias reflection seems to be one of the pathways to promote um, some aspects of wisdom, as well as potentially alignment of your experienced emotions to other emotions. We also found some other things which you can check out in the paper. Which parts of wisdom were particularly affected by Eliasm? Intellectual humility, openness to diverse perspectives, search for conflict resolution. Now, what is this um, method really highlight? One of the things that I find really exciting about it is that it shows a, a use of situated training in the context of daily experiences. So this is not a minimal intervention where I go into the classroom, tell people you're awesome or think about the future and suddenly uh, it uh, improves your uh, scores dramatically. Frankly, I don't believe in those type of interventions. I think in order to institute re uh, reliable and strong change, you need to ecologically sample from different experiences in people's everyday life, which is what this intervention did. Every single day, people reported on the most significant experience, and then they trained themselves to reflect on this variety of experiences in a particular way. I think it's a powerful of doing it. It's also a very costly one of doing it, but it's probably a realistic way of doing it. The other uh, issue here is that we focus on this kind of repeated focus on first set experiences rather than single shot um, manipulations, which may or may not work for all sorts of reasons. If you want to know more about this work, please check out uh, this uh, psych science paper that came out this year, the free copy for which is available on psych archive. If you just put in Psych Archive Training for Wisdom. You can download the free copy and in case you want to have a nice looking uh, Psych Science version, go to Psych Science through your library. Um, that's all I have in case you have any questions, you can email me or tweet or reach out in any other way. And the final thing that I would like to highlight in conclusion of this symposium and before opening the general questions, we still have quite a bit, is that, um, just in a few months, we will have the first big international wisdom summit uh, to address some of the pressing issues of the day. Uh, and um, it's a free event. It will be on October 11th. Uh, the website is wisdomsummit.uwaterloo.ca. And we are welcoming flash talk submissions from junior scholars and we'll have a terrific lineup, some of which is already on the website. So please check it out. And I hope uh, we can continue the conversation about wisdom there. We really try to bring the world together, not only people from some areas or some parts of the world, but 
from different disciplines in different parts of the world. Okay, and that's all what I have to say. And now let's open it up for any additional general questions. So we have one question here. And the question is, uh, can we comment on whether increased wisdom can lead to worse moral decisions? For example, seeing several perspectives leading to lack of action. Uh, that is certainly possible. This reminds me a little bit of work done in Korea by Inchul Choi, uh, where um, you know, being uh, wise to some extent, some of the forms of metacognition that we talk about here include uh, recognizing uh, merits of different perspectives. And that can also include recognizing merits of perspectives that may be uh, not necessarily accurate. You may deliberate on them longer before making a decision. So yes, yeah, so there is some evidence uh, to that. Uh, it hasn't been uh, I, I haven't seen much follow-up work on that. Maybe Jonah can also speak to this um, as uh, our resident misinformation expert uh, or uh, Melody as the intergroup expert. But I, I, I would say, yes, that, uh, certainly not in all situations you need wisdom. Uh, when you're riding a bicycle, you probably don't need wisdom. When you're making love to your special person, you probably don't need wisdom. Um, Wisdom is needed for resolving certain uncertain situations without clear-cut, uh, well-defined solutions. So maybe a quick response to that question too. I think uh, there could be the perception that no, it would lead to inaction. But then actually, in one of our study, we found that people who are higher in wise reasoning um, were actually less polarized in their attitude, which actually lead to more active action towards. The outgroup, like promoting the for social behavior towards the outgroup supporting minority groups. So I think it really depends on the context. So we actually need to understand wisdom in a more contextualized manner. I completely agree with that. Um, there's a second question from Lehman who asks, um, what is the uh, difference between or oh, similarity between wisdom and intelligence? Um, okay, so um, one of the the uh, similarities is uh, that uh, both are complex constructs that have been debated in philosophy for a very long time. In psychology, we have some kind of very narrow definition of intelligence. It depends on how you define intelligence. If you mean by intelligence, fluid abilities, uh, quick problem resolution, well, uh, wisdom is kind of orthogonal to that. Of course, you need some ability to sort of process information in order to even envision different possibilities. Uh, in order to be able to balance them. But beyond that, it seems to be orthogonal. And certainly we know that, for instance, such things as active open-minded thinking, which one could consider to be one of the features, metacognitive features uh, related to wisdom, seems not to be strongly, if at all, related to general level of IQ. Um, but that depends on how you define intelligence. And for instance, Simone Binet would have actually completely disagreed with the assertion that intelligence and wisdom are different. Uh, but of course, modern intelligence researchers don't really follow Binet's tradition, do they? Uh, but yeah, so there's some, some of it is necessary, but then beyond that, uh, in, empirically, the correlation is very, very weak if present in the non-clinical population at all. And functionally, they're different. Okay, any additional thoughts or questions? We have one more minute before we have to conclude this session. Well, before we conclude, I would like to thank my dear co-presenters. Thank you so much, especially for Jonah to be awake. Uh, it is almost midnight uh, here in North America. And uh, for some of you, uh, it is tomorrow. Uh, this conference for Joan and myself is like the window into the future world uh, in which uh, Melody, Patricia, and many others uh, on uh, in your side of the world live in, which is fascinating. Um, and um, thank you all for listening. And in case you have additional questions, uh, please put them in the chat uh, on the wooer. Uh, please reach out to us. Uh, there you can find us, schedule meetings with us during the conference will be available and check out the uh, wisdom 
a summit uh, that will happen on October 11th in case you're interested in this topic. Take care, everybody. <laughs>